So um, this sutta is called uh, a monk, Bhikkhu Sutta. And uh, uh, the reason why I have included this sutta is because it shows uh, some of the foundations of, again, of meditation practice. Uh, and it makes it more clear, again, uh, what it is that we have to do uh, to have success in meditation. So uh, let's just start with it and see what happens. Uh, so um, a monk, yeah. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's monastery. Yeah. Then a mendicant went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side and said to him, Sir, May the Buddha please teach me the Dhamma in brief. When I've heard it, I will live alone with a drawn, diligent, keen, and resolute. So here we have one of the standard ways that the suttas often are presented, how they start out. Of course, the Buddha staying at Savati again. Every sutta we have seen so far, the Buddha or Venerable Sariputta or whatever is staying at Savati. You can see how important this monastery was. And then you have a typical situation where a monastic will go up to the Buddha and they will ask for a teaching. And they will ask for a teaching because they are ready to practice seriously. They want to withdraw and kind of go into the forest or whatever. And, but they need something to reflect on. They need something to carry with them when they go into the forest, into seclusion. And uh, this shows you a little bit about how things were done at the time of the Buddha, because they didn't have as many teachings as we have. Yeah, they may have heard a few teachings, uh, but they want to have a specific thing that they can contemplate uh, to support them when they are in seclusion. And of course, one of the things about the Buddha, you know, the Buddha will look at you and he will kind of see through you. He will have that kind of powerful look where you feel like, oh, he's seeing everything within me. He sees every thought I have and these kind of things. And of course, the Buddha has, will have that ability to understand different personalities, the different inclination of beings. So he will give you a teaching that is very suited to you. And this is why people will come to the Buddha in this way. But at the time of ancient India, this was much more important because they didn't have the teachings in writing or whatever. So it was much more important to have a teaching that you can carry with you in this way. And so this is kind of interesting, right? It shows you how little you actually need to remember, how little teaching you actually require to be able to practice well. The Buddha gives you one teaching, you take that teaching with you, and that is all you have. We don't need to make it so complicated. Yeah? We don't need to have the whole tipitika to understand what is going on. If you have one inspiring teaching that really fires you up, that really you feel, wow, this is so beautiful, the whole path being almost encapsulated in that short teaching, that is often enough for you to reflect on and then take you forward in your practice. It can be something very simple like the Ovada Patimokkha. You probably, many of you will know the Ovada Patimokkha, where the Buddha says that uh, uh, one should uh, avoid doing what is bad. One should practice what is good. One should purify the mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Yeah, and if you remember that much, actually, you're going to go a very long way on the path as a consequence. So sometimes just remembering a little bit of the Dhamma, carrying these beautiful bits of the Dhamma with you throughout the day to remind you, to inspire you, to keep you on the right track during the day can be incredibly beautiful and very powerful. Just the memory that you should live with kindness, avoiding what is bad, doing what is good and purifying you. If you remember that during the day, in every situation, when you are with people, when you are difficulties arise, it guides you in the right way. It shows you what you're supposed to be doing here. Yeah, so it can be very useful. Most of the time, you just need mindfulness, but this can also be very useful. And this is how they often live at the time of the Buddha. And there are places in the suttas where the monastics ask the Buddha 
these kind of things. How much do you actually need to know? How much do you need to, how many suttas do you need to study? Yeah, and maybe we are studying too many suttas. Maybe <laughs> there's just too many suttas on these kind of retreats. I'm not sure. Huh? But the Buddha says, if you remember one verse, a single verse of four lines, and you understand that deeply, that can be sufficient to take you all the way to awakening if you take it properly. For most people, it is not enough. Most people need more inspiration. I know I need more inspiration. I need to really read the suttas very broadly, maybe because I don't know, I don't have those very powerful spiritual faculties, perhaps. But uh, it shows you that uh, the significance is more important to go deeply into a single teaching than sometimes to read very broadly. Anyway, this is what he does. And then he wants to withdraw, yeah, alone, withdrawn, diligent, like heedful, keen, inspired, inspired by the teaching, resolute, having that energy in your practice. But then the Buddha replies. He says, this is exactly how some foolish people ask me for something. But when the teaching has been explained, they think only of following me around. Yes, the Buddha is saying here that actually people get these teachings and then they don't use them properly. Instead of using these teachings in the right way, they just hang around. Yeah, they want to hang around with the Buddha. And you know what it's like when you are with a great spiritual master, some of these very powerful people in the world, uh, when you are with them, you kind of enjoy it, just being with them because you feel maybe the metta, you feel the kindness, uh, you feel the support that you get from these beings. Uh, and you just want to sit there. You don't want to kind of bathe in the aura. <laughs> you don't really want to. That's good enough. Yeah. And you're happy with it. And I've seen that happen many times. Yeah. When I've been with some of these great Buddhist uh, masters around the world, that this is often what happens. People just hang around <laughs> and they enjoy themselves. But that is not the point. Yeah. In the end, the purpose of the Dhamma is precisely to withdraw, even following the Buddha around. Don't, the Buddha is saying, don't follow me around yeah go off into the forest if you follow me around you're going to be hanging out with all the people it's going to be very crowded because a lot of people want to see the buddha go off on your own yeah go into the forest go to a meditation retreat center do these things where you can really practice in the right way so he's giving this monk an, an encouragement yeah to live in the right way to do the right thing here so you can see the, uh, the sometimes the Buddha can be quite, uh, he can be a bit um, direct. Yeah, He gives you advice directly. He is probably friendly. He's coming from loving kindness, uh, but he's also saying things in quite a direct way so that you understand what you're supposed to do. And of course, then the monk becomes a little bit kind of, uh, um, he understands, yeah? And so then he begs the Buddha, sir, May the Buddha please teach me the Dhamma in brief. May the Holy One, the Holy One is the Sugato, again the Buddha, teach me the Dhamma in brief. Hopefully I can understand the meaning of what the Buddha says. Hopefully I can be the heir of the Buddha's teaching. Yeah. So the uh, idea here is that he understands, okay, yes, this imp is important. I will really listen to what you have, what you are saying, and then I will go off into the forest and do the right thing. Yeah. Please, please, Venerable Sir, give me a teaching for my benefit. Then this is the teaching that the Buddha gives. Yeah, this is what he says. And he says, well then, mendicant, well then, monk, you should purify the starting point of skillful qualities. What is the starting point of skillful qualities? Well purified ethics and correct view. When your ethics are well purified and your view is correct, then you should develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation in three ways depending on and grounded on ethics. Yeah, so uh, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, well, this is the four satipatthanas. This is the mindfulness of breathing. This is the foundation of meditation as we find it in the suttas. 
But to be able to do that, to be able to watch the breath, uh, and a large, it's very common to find it difficult for people to find it difficult to watch the breath. Yeah, and uh, uh, I'm sure many of you have experienced that. Maybe all of you have experienced that. Sometimes it's very hard. Uh, so the foundation here is really the significant thing. Yeah? And this is why the Buddha points out this foundation, the starting point, where we should start out. What are the foundational good qualities that we should build up in ourselves? This is so important. Without that, the meditation is not going to work. And what are these foundational skillful qualities? Well, they are purified ethics. Uh, so purified ethics is just kindness. Yeah? This is what I call kindness in the, when I teach, because kindness is very broad and it brings in all the various aspects of ethics. On the one hand, it is kindness. And on the other hand, it is correct view. And, and I always found this very interesting, this particular uh, point that purified ethics and correct view are taught together in this way as the foundation not just the foundation of the entire spiritual path, uh, not as the foundation of insight, uh, but as the foundation of meditation practice. Uh, yeah? Why is a correct view an important part to make meditation work? And the reason is because if you are going to be able to focus on the breath, uh, you have to give priority to the breath. Uh, you have to make the breath important. The breath has to be more important than all the other things in the world. How are you going to make the breath more important than all the other things in the world? Well, the only way you're going to do that is because you know that the breath actually is what matters and all the other things are not as important. But usually it is the other way around. The vast majority of people, they think it is the things in the world that are important how we make progress in our careers, how we gain whatever there is to be had in the world. That is what we normally think of as the most important. And then we do practice maybe the Dhamma and the Buddhist teachings as a support for success in the world. But if we do it in that way, we're never going to have success in meditation. Because if we see the worldly things as the most important, then when you sit down and you try to be peaceful, as we're doing just now, the mind will very quickly go and think about the worldly things. Why? Because that is what is important in our life. That is what we consider the priority and the spiritual life is secondary only to support what we are doing in the worldly life. So by correcting our view, by understanding what is really in our long term, um, for our long term benefit, uh, by seeing these things in the right way, uh, we actually enable meditation to happen. Uh, it is such an important thing to understand. Uh, and this is why I have been saying all along about the world is out of control. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the world. We don't know what's going to happen in our work, in our family life, in the world at large, outside, in terms of all of these things that can go wrong in the world. We have no idea. There is no refuge to be had in that world. That world is just too uncertain. And because of that uncertainty, because there's no refuge to be had there, we find the refuge in the only place where it can be found. And that is on the spiritual path within ourselves, the home within where we can find that peace and security inside. And that is where we actually create the future. So that is the idea of right view. And I'm going to talk much more about this because I think this is such an important part of things. And as your mind then gradually shifts and you start to understand things in the right way, meditation becomes more powerful. You're less distracted by all the external thoughts and all of these things. And then things really start to come together in your practice. Let's take a five minute break. Okay, so the um, Buddha talks about the idea of correct view. Yeah, And again, it's very interesting that it actually matters so enormously for meditation practice because it gives you the priorities. It shows you what we should prioritize, what really we should focus on in our life. But uh, the correct view really only works if you also purify your ethics. 
if you live with kindness, yeah? Remember when I say kindness, I don't mean anything superficial. I mean something incredibly profound because kindness is very difficult. If you're gonna take kindness to its limit all the way, it actually has to do with your entire life, all your conduct, the way you think, the way you perceive the world, the way you act, the way you speak. It is a very, very broad thing, the idea of kindness. So when you understand ethics in the right way, it is this, it's basically about your entire life. That is what ethics really is about. So kindness. And the idea here is that when you have the right view, yeah, then you understand, okay, let me let go a little bit of the world. The world is not so important. But then you need something else to support your meditation. But just, because just giving up the world is not going to work. You need something to take its place. And what takes its place is the ethics. The kindness that you live in your daily life gives you an inner glow, an inner power, an inner peace, yeah, that enables you to meditate properly because you have that stability inside which comes from that kindness within. So kindness here gives you the support that makes meditation possible. You cannot just give up the world. You cannot just give up all of these things and have nothing in its place. It is only when you have the good, the good feeling within that uh, comes from kindness, that the giving up of the world becomes possible. So purified ethics always goes together with correct view. Uh, yeah, the correct view and the, uh, this, the, these two things coming together in this way is what allows meditation to happen because you have that solid foundation right there. So I hope you get the idea of what I am talking about. Uh, and. Um, and then comes the meditation, yeah? And this is why the Buddha says that when your ethics are well purified uh, and your view is correct, uh, the uh, Pali word here is ujjaka, and ujjaka means like your view is straight. And straight, of course, means straight. It aligns with the teachings of the Buddha. You have a view which aligns with how the Buddha sees the world. Uh, then, and only then can you develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation in three different ways, depending on and grounded on ethics. So what exactly does that mean, depending on and grounded on ethics? And of course, it means that the general idea of kindness is a very powerful support for meditation. But what it also means, it means the idea when we often talk in Buddhism, we talk about sila nusati, which is the recollection of our sila. Yes, sila is what is ethics here. Sila is what I mean by kindness and all of these kind of things. Yeah. So we also recall these things. It's a sila nusati. It's a recollection of the way we live. And this becomes a very important grounding for the meditation practice. Because when you recall, when you know that you are living well, and sometimes you don't have to recall very much, it's almost like obvious, yeah? you just know that you are living well, so you feel good about yourself. When you recall that, you feel the gladness inside, you feel the joy inside, and of course that joy, that gladness is what brightens you up and what enables you to watch the breath. That is where the breath becomes very powerful. That is where the mindfulness meditation actually really works. Yeah, so the, when we're talking about grounded on ethics, it actually also implies this whole idea of recalling your good conduct, recalling your generosity, the chaga nusati, and all of these things, yeah? And before I was talking about the idea of the Kalyana Mitta during the meditation, and that is another recollection talked about in the suttas, whereby you re recall the fact that you are so fortunate to have all of these wonderful Kalyana Mittas, yeah? And that also kind of comes together with ethics in a sense, because it means that you remember the ethics and the goodness in the community around you that also reflects on your own ethics and kind of the whole thing comes together in this way it becomes one of the most very the most important support for meditation practice 
And this is why I think Sila Nusanti is probably the best kind of contemplation to do to support your meditation, to remember that uh, kindness that you are living with them. So what are these four kinds of mindfulness meditation? And you know this already. I'm just going to go through it very quickly because these are the things that we look at. Uh, we're going to be looking at in much more detail. These are the four satipatthanas. So let me just uh, read through them just for the sake of uh, completeness in this particular sutta. And maybe very briefly comment a little bit, but not very much. So these are, you meditate by observing you know, or contemplating an aspect of the body internally. You are keen, aware and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Yeah? Or you meditate observing an aspect of the body externally. Keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. You meditate observing an aspect of the body, both internally and externally. Keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. So this is the standard way that Satipatthana practice, the mindfulness meditation is explained in the suttas. And this is a very interesting little passage right there. All the little aspects here are very important, but I'm not going to tell you now. This is just a preview so that when we get to the Satipatthana Sutta, yeah, later on we get to the actual Sutta about this, uh, then we can go through these things in the detail. So this is just to get you excited to make sure you come back on the next few days uh, so you don't miss out on this explanation. Here. So now I'm just going to say, yeah, this is, this is what it is about. This is the body contemplation, first of all, the Kaya Nupasana. Then you meditate observing an aspect of feelings, internally, externally, internally, and externally. Keen, aware, mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Yeah, so first of all, the body, then the feelings. Then you meditate observing an aspect of the mind, internally, externally, internally, and externally. Keen, aware, and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. Then you meditate, observing an aspect of principles or maybe phenomena, internally, externally, internally and externally. Keen, aware and mindful, rid of desire and aversion for the world. When you develop the four kinds of mindfulness meditation in these three ways, depending on and grounded on ethics, you can expect growth, not decline in wholesome qualities, whether by day or by night. So uh, this is the path, yeah? and this is how then uh, meditation gradually, gradually increases your wholesome qualities. Uh, and uh, this is one of the, I think, uh, important guidelines in the suttas. You have this idea of always improving and growing in skillful qualities. Uh, and this is one of the things that I think you should always ask yourself. Yeah, you should ask yourself, uh, are you growing in spiritual, in uh, good qualities? Uh, can you see that there is an increase uh, happening over time? Can you see that you are changing, that you're actually moving in the right direction? Uh, and if you're not increasing in good qualities and skillful qualities, uh, then you should ask yourself why that actually is the case. Uh, because that means that you're not actually gaining the benefit of this practice. There should always be that growth in skillful qualities there. This is, in a way is a very powerful way of reminding yourself whether you're actually heading in the right direction or not. And we need these kind of guidelines to ensure that we actually are going in the right direction. Otherwise, you may stop up and you may not go anywhere at all. This, of course, is going to be very problematic. Yeah. And then we just have the uh, end of the sutta uh, very quickly. Uh, and then that mendicant approved and agreed with what the Buddha said. Uh, he got up from his seat, bowed, uh, respectfully circled the Buddha, keeping him on his right, 
and then he left. Then that mendicant, he did what he said he was going to do. Yeah, he lived alone, withdrawn, diligent, keen, energetic, resolute. And then he soon realized the supreme end of the spiritual path in this very life. He lived having achieved with his own insight the goal for which gentlemen. Yeah, gentlemen, does that make sense? <laughs> The idea of gentlemen, right? So, or maybe gentle women. Maybe we should have gentle. Maybe gentle people is a better translation. But uh, it is fascinating. Why? Why is the word gentleman there? What does that got to do with it? Uh, isn't it just people? Why does it say gentlemen? Gentlemen rightly go forth from the lay life to homelessness, uh, and the word behind gentleman here is kula puta. It means like a person who belongs to a clan, yeah, belongs to a, an extended family. And these were like the establishment of ancient India. So that the establishment, the people who belong to kind of the higher ranges of society, they would also go forth. Yeah? And this is how they found that supreme end of the spiritual life. Uh, the point here is just that anyone has the benefit of, you know, it's, it's beneficial for everyone to go forth in this way and actually become a monastic. Yeah? That's really the point. That's why you have the word gentleman there, because it may sound a bit strange. It may sound as if this is some kind of practice done by a proper British, uh, you know, person of a certain class who practices in the right way. And uh, it is a little bit like that. Yeah, it's a little bit like that because it doesn't matter. That's the point. Uh, what your position in life is. Yeah, it doesn't really matter because uh, uh, regardless of what it is this, is, a, this is what we should all be doing because life just isn't that satisfactory wherever you are in the, whatever your station in life is. And then it says he understood, rebirth is ended. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. There is no return to any state of existence. And that mendicant became one of the perfected ones. In other words, he became an arahant yeah, as a consequence. And uh, that is then what uh, happened to this monk. He followed the instructions of the Buddha in a very good way. And uh, as a result, he uh, then went all the way to the end of the path. And this is what we can expect too. If you do these things fully and you practice these things all the way, uh, that is the outcome of this. So it's a pretty good outcome. And all we really have to do is then to have the ethics, to have the right view at the beginning, practice the meditation, and bang, you become an arahant as a consequence. It's a very good deal. So I, I uh, recommend you to uh, engage in this deal yeah, and to actually take it up. All right. For now, let's have a five-minute break again, and then we can do.